This week, it's the Revert's Guide to Catholic Conversion with Eddie Trask. Eddie is a revert to the Catholic faith. He was raised Catholic, received the sacraments, and then kind of wandered away from the church and got involved in some not great, he would admit, behavior. He began to, to reignite his Christian faith and ended up joining some non-denominational Protestant churches and spent some time there as a Protestant Christian. And it was through there he kind of asked some questions similar to many converts, many actual just converts to the Catholic faith, about Christianity and the roots of his Protestant faith and began to trace those things backwards and eventually ended up re-looking at the roots of his Catholic faith. He is, for all intents and purposes, really a convert to the Catholic faith, but raised Catholic with some, some roots and the sacraments. And so this story is a really interesting perspective on the Catholic conversion experience from a revert to the Catholic faith. We dig into authority, the Bible, scripture, the Holy Spirit, tradition, Luther, the Reformation, and really the roots of some of the splits in the Protestant church and how that really begins in the Reformation itself and how Eddie saw these things and was drawn back into the Catholic faith uh, of his childhood he was raised in. Eddie is an amazing storyteller with an awesome story to tell and some wicked insights into Protestant Catholic issues. You're going to love this episode, so please have a look, have a listen, and enjoy Eddie Trask, A Revert's Guide to Catholic Conversions. You're going to love it. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, give us a little like and a subscribe to this channel so there's, uh, and hit the bell so you're notified when new videos uh, like this one come out. And if you're listening on podcast, thanks for listening, friends. Make sure you subscribe to the show and make sure that if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, you leave a rating or review because those ratings and reviews help to push the podcast out to new people and spread the word, the mission, the thing that is driving this, this podcast and this thing. Please share share this stuff. Uh, my guest this week for our fantastic conversation is Eddie Trask. He's a revert to the Catholic faith in 2019 and has since focused his time on studying and evangelizing. He holds an MBA from Sonoma State University and is currently pursuing an MA in theology at the Augustine Institute. Great place. He also works for the Augustine Institute as the manager of digital consumer products, overseeing the Amen, or is it Amen app and the Catholic.market. He is a third degree Knight of Columbus and co-host of Salt and Light Radio's Man Cave show. His awesome YouTube channel, Catholic Recon, shares uh, exists to share testimonies from Catholic reverts and converts. Uh, check out my recent appearance on that uh, channel if you want to have a little bit of a snooze fest. There are much, much better content on there than mine, Eddie. It's awesome stuff. Welcome to the show, uh, Eddie, and hello. Keith. Thank you so much for having me. And you're absolutely right. It, it well, not the it's snooze. a snooze fest. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks, but Eddie. you were a recent guest, and we had a blast, actually. Yeah. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, Eddie. I appreciate a guest who could insult the host in, within the first five seconds of their appearance on the show. So you're you're doing well, Eddie. I do appreciate that. Uh, we had an awesome conversation on, on your channel, and I love the work you're doing there. It's really in the, the wheelhouse of this show, too, those kind of conversion stories. Uh, you're a revert uh, with a fantastic story of your own, though. So what I want to do uh, on, on this show, because this is a, a question that I actually had recently from a couple of e emails from listeners who said, hey, I love your conversion stories, but I, I want to hear some some revert, some, I don't know, reversion? <laughs> is that a word? So the stories of some of these reverts who who left the faith and came back, because, you know, one, one listener wrote and said, I'm in this place where I've left the faith for a while. I'm struggling to try and figure out how I can come back to this this faith. And maybe some compelling reasons of why I should return. I'm, I'm on the edges. I'm not. I'm not super sure. So Eddie, you're filling. You're filling a gap here in the show for us. You're scratching an itch for some of the listeners to this show. I'm going to get out of the way and let you kind of tell your story for as, as far back as you want to go, sure. and then lots of stuff for us to dig into. Well, I think already in my mind, I'm thinking of multiple episode, a season with with Eddie Trask on this show because a lot I want to dig into with you. But we'll start there and see where we get to, Eddie. So take us back. What the genesis of your faith journey. Where does this begin? Where does this go? Take us on a little trip here. Eddie. Well, I was I was raised Catholic, obviously, and that's I, otherwise I wouldn't be a revert at this point. <laughs> but um, what I got to say about being raised Catholic is 
and I've mentioned this to many people, you receive all the sacraments, you go to catechism, you do everything. And it's up to you to decide, are these mere checklists or are these somehow opening your heart to something much greater? And most of my life, I can say I had little bits, little glimpses of who God was, but more often than not, I was just checking boxes and trying to get through whatever that class may be or whatever that next thing was. And so when I left home and I found myself in college, I immediately stopped going to the Catholic Church, like a lot of people. And it's not as if I found another expression of Christianity fulfilling. I wasn't even looking for that. What I found fulfilling was the world and not thinking about religion and not thinking about tradition, not thinking about discipline, not thinking about what it means to be a wise human being. For me, there was a lot of drinking specifically, a lot of drinking in college and uh, pornography. And those were the two big areas that I feel spoke to me in a sense when I was just so disillusioned. And out of college and into further into my 20s, I met my wife who was raised Seventh day Adventist. Oh. And she had left the church, I don't know formally or how they, they deal with that, but around 15 years old, I'd say, she had left her childhood faith. And so we met and everything's going great, but she starts to ask me about my Catholic background. I guess it came up in conversation. And immediately I said, oh, I'm a, I'm a Catholic. Like I was still affirming Catholicism and I had no idea what I was talking about. And so she peppered me with some questions that I had no answers to. And I got frustrated. I probably walked out of the room. I mean, very immature response for sure. Responses. And over time, she, I guess, was zealous to get started in some church. She knew we weren't going to go to the Catholic church. We weren't going to go to the Adventist church. So we start looking around. Okay, where are we going to check out? And we went to a Baptist church. We went to a Pentecostal church. Of course, none of these churches said Baptist or Pentecostal on the name. It was just you show up and you see this new expression. And the way the pastor was addressing the congregants varied. I had no idea what I was supposed to do or say, whatever, right? Just like a Protestant going to a Catholic service, not knowing what's going on. So anyway, we hopped around and around and around, and we finally found a non-denominational church that was on its way to becoming a mega church. So we didn't know that. We just heard good things about this church that was in a shopping center. So that's a common thing is you, you go from kind of the cafeteria, you go from living room, to maybe a school cafeteria, to maybe this um, shopping center. And then ultimately, if you do enough fundraising, you can get a plot of land and and start to build a real church. So I loved it there. And at at that church, uh, the whole lifting of hands was very uncomfortable initially. But over time, I think several things were at play. One, I didn't know who the heck I was, so I was probably trying to find some sense of identity. So I look around and I see everyone lifting their hands and many people crying and really putting themselves out there. I ended up doing that. And along with that were these altar calls. Hey, if if you are distant from God and if you feel disillusioned, so it was hitting on all these points all these feelings, emotions that I had from my teenage years. If you're feeling these things, look up at me, lift your hand and say, I'm ready to give my life to the Lord. So when I did that, I was already just choked up and and they asked everyone at that moment to come forward. So I did and I'm crying my eyes out. I don't know what I'm saying. There were probably a few dozen people around me some of which were crying. All I knew was that something prompted me 
and I was unbelievably emotional. Um, and so people were telling me that that was me giving my heart to the Lord. But what's funny is all those problems I had in college and even in teen, my teenage years, they were still there. I didn't, I didn't even know what had just happened. I didn't feel necessarily this warm, fuzzy feeling that people describe when they're touched by the Holy Spirit. I had none of that. So I went home and year after year after year, I would go, we would go to this church and I was not changing. I was living a double life in a sense, the drinking, the pornography still. And here I am married at the point, I, at this point married, I don't know how many years, seven, eight years. Well, at that time, my wife was starting to suffer from rheumatoid arthritis and there was a message that week. Um, it was, there was actually a series about healing. And so our pastor got up and he spoke about healing and it was all great, very encouraging, very inspiring. The next week there was a guest speaker and as she started to speak, she was contradicting what the pastor said the week before. And I was just in a bubble. I don't know how, how this happened, but my wife is the one that noticed it. I didn't notice it. And we went home and she said, something's wrong. She said the complete opposite of what he said. And it was, it really came down to what is God's will? Our, our pastor was saying it's his will to allow many things to form you, to sanctify you. And then the guest speaker of the same background, let's say, same denominational background was saying it is not his will that anyone <laughs> suffers. So it's a matter of you not having enough faith. So if you want to get healed, you need more faith. So for some reason that prompted a bunch of research on my side. And I started to recognize that the non-denominational movement stemmed from somewhere and Baptist churches and expressions of Baptist theology stemmed from somewhere and Pentecostal and charismatic branches and Calvary Chapel and four square gospel, everything could be traced to a founder that it was not, that was not Jesus Christ. Now that didn't, at first, I didn't recognize that part. I just knew that I was trying to get to a genesis. And that led to researching um, the Lutheran church, the reformed branches, you know, Calvinist soteriology, things like that. One denomination after another, I was researching and recognizing who the founder was and how all these theological differences started. And again, I, I could only see up to the Reformation. I couldn't see past <laughs> 1517 or before 1517. So I was committed to take us to a Calvinist church or a Baptist church. Um, I have to add that during this period of time, this is probably six weeks, seven weeks, we stopped going to our church because we could not we were so shaken up by the fact that they, that was the other thing. Our pastor at the time, when she's up, the guest speaker's up speaking, he's clapping and nodding as she's contradicting him. I didn't see that either, my wife's. <laughs> but wow. that was starting to make sense that, okay, what do we believe? Can anyone just get up and start throwing out different things and everyone's going to agree? So, I could not see past that wall. I'm trying to figure out where should we go next? And I fell asleep. And in the morning, probably two in the morning, I felt God convict me, I guess, that something needed to happen. I remember it pretty well. I was in the restroom trying i was so emotional i had to get out of bed and i'm leaning over the toilet sobbing and i'm crying out to god what you're trying to tell me something what is it something was not computing I, it was so surreal um and eventually i felt in my spirit that i needed to research catholicism so by the next morning that barrier that was standing there 
I felt like it toppled over. It at least had some, some breaks in it. And I started to research from the early church forward to the Reformation and started to see things with a new perspective. And within a few weeks of researching objections, so all this stuff I'm researching, I knew none of it. Even being raised Catholic, I knew none of it. I couldn't see it. And uh, I'm researching objections. I'm, I'm reading blogs. I'm reading articles. I'm opening the Bible for the first time in a while, um, especially with a, with a Catholic lens. And that's something I realized that everyone has glasses that they put on when they go to investigate the Bible. So if my theology was formed by someone in the 1960s, I have to put on his glasses or her glasses and then say, oh man, everything's here. But then you have to see what, like, what is the source of those lenses? And I was starting to realize that the Catholic Church had every answer for every question that I had. And probably another four weeks went by, five weeks, I was already just on fire internally. Like I've got to return to the church. This is the most remarkable thing I've ever seen in my life. And I finally shared it with my wife and she wasn't too pleased. So (laughs) last conversation we had was about potentially going to a reformed church. And she wasn't even fond of that. She couldn't understand predestination. And we didn't know much about their theology, but that was one thing that stood out to her. Uh, Anyway, over time, she wanted to investigate everything that I was saying to prove me wrong. And you've probably heard that. I've heard that in a number of episodes that I've recorded where a spouse, a uh, man or woman, wants to, to prove the other wrong. Like, how can Catholicism, how can it be true? If you're raised Protestant and happen to be in a denomination that ridicules or misrepresents the Catholic faith, well, you don't know that they're misrepresenting the Catholic faith. So shedding all of that takes a lot of time. It's very emotional. So maybe four months later, she comes to me and says, I don't understand all of it, but I've researched enough to know that this is right. (laughs) And I'm going to join RCIA. And we were in the process uh, that that week that she said, whatever, maybe it was two weeks before we were making a huge move from California to Idaho. <laughs> we got our marriage con validated that same week. And at the time we had three kids, they were all baptized. It was beautiful. Well, we moved to a new state and we're trying to figure out, was this right? I knew it was right. The, the Catholic faith is right. But she was having doubts about how she went about it, who should she involve, you know, our CIA in a new state. I know no one here, et cetera, et cetera. So before we move, the week before we move, she, one of the things she still had trouble with was connecting with her mother, Mary. She said, this is so bizarre to me. I don't know. I don't this relationship. I almost yearn for it, but I don't know how to make this happen. Right. And she said, what would be cool is if we could find artwork or some type of painting or illustration of mother Mary that maybe I could purchase and have in the bedroom or, or somewhere. And as she's flipping through all these pictures, I don't know if we did it at the same time, but she came to an image and she said, I think this is the one. And I said, yes, that there's something about that image. Fast forward five weeks. We are now in Idaho. The second family that we met, we get a call from them. Hey, we want to have you over for dinner. Why don't you come to our house? We go into their house, walk into the kitchen. What image is in the kitchen but that very (laughs) image? That is not a popular image. It's not one that you could say, oh, this is in every Catholic household. It's not the immaculate (laughs) heart, right? It was, I I got 
teary eyed. Yeah. I, I was like, is this real? And um, uh, my wife's uh, friend, Gina, she said, oh, you like that, huh? I said, yeah. She said, my aunt drew that. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time we were done with dinner, she's walking out with a signed copy of that image. Uh, I still can't get over it. It's, it's the most incredible thing. Wow. Uh, so what I was trying to explain is we were looking, I think, for a sign that everything was going to be okay. <laughs> and, you know, it's this image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so my, uh, I have some Hispanic heritage there were so many things happening in that moment, in those moments that connected me to our mother and my heritage and my upbringing. It brought back memories of masses. It brought back memories of me altar serving. Just phenomenal stuff. So she entered RCIA and entered the church. Um, that was in 2020. So I reverted in 2019, and then she came into the church in 2020. I don't know if that all made sense, but that's 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 an amazing story. It's it's almost. I mean, there's so much I want to unpack there. I don't, I don't yeah. want to get ahead of myself, but there's, it's almost as if like your story is very similar to many conversion stories I I have on this channel, right? Except that the the fact that you were you were Catholic to begin yeah. with. You had the sacraments. You you were not having to go back through RCIA or something. You you had all those things, but you hadn't been, you know, you were very the very much like a, a vanilla Christian though in, in that sense. Like you didn't you didn't know those things despite having the sacraments. You didn't know a lot about the Catholic faith. So you like I was were kind of researching from scratch yes. different denominations and then, then the Catholic faith. That's so I mean as you uncovered those things you said a little bit, but there, yeah. like that, that was all brand new for you. Like that, the history of, of the Catholic faith yes, from the early church onward, that was, that was brand new. Like that was, that's so interesting. Well, what's funny is I, some people say, oh, that's so sad. Well, <laughs> maybe in the moment it was sad, but I can tell you one thing. I can get into the Protestant shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that hopefully is helpful. Um, when I'm interviewing people, because what they're explaining, I may not have had it completely because I wasn't cradle Protestant, but the idea that you can't see past the Reformation, nor do you want to. In my, in my case, it's not that I didn't want to, but there are people, there are two different types. There are those that don't want to see past that, that don't want to research, and those that are open to it, but they know that it's going to be, it's going to take some time to really unpack this and it's going to take a lot of grace to be persistent in what you're finding and to remove biases. I didn't even want, I didn't even think Catholicism was an option. Yeah. That's what I want people to know. So anyone that says, Oh, it's easy. It was your childhood faith. I said, I was blessed to have that childhood faith, but that in no way was even viable when I was going through this process. It was like you said, from scratch. And the other thing, I skipped right over it. This was monumental um, that kind of kick-started everything. People can read about it. I wrote a book. If, if people deal with scrupulosity, if they deal with sexual sin, if they deal with um, double lives, things like that, then it would be something that they might want to read. Otherwise, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because the book is me – the book starts with me confessing to my wife. So this was in 2017, I, and yeah, it's weird that I skipped over it. Um, I was on a walk and I felt the Holy Spirit, the same conviction, the same type of conviction that I told you about when I was leaning over the toilet, sobbing my eyes out that happened on a walk, uh, in September of 2017, where I felt the Holy Spirit convict me that I'm going to confess my sins to my wife. And that started a process that I would never, ever wish yeah on anyone because she didn't know me at all. I was a, I covered my entire life for good or for, I mean, for better or for worse. That was 99% of counselors would say you should have never done that. But what happened was you can read about it. I had no other option. It was the most intense uh, period of our lives. And it 
in a weird way started to repair our marriage and started to shine light on everything that I was, every mistake I made, it started to shine light on our marriage and all of the issues that we had. And in that process, I think all of that led to this research and, and also led her to say that she began to trust me to a point where when I, even though she was trying to prove me wrong with the Catholic faith, she said, I'm going to investigate it. You're actually being truthful so often that how could I not look into it? And then eventually she said, thank the Lord that I looked into it and God's grace was with me. So yeah, that's the, uh, that's the quick version of, of the, uh, crazy crazy period yeah <laughs> that's 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 so interesting i mean and then you i i'm curious okay so let's dig in there for a minute i'm curious that in that case for you because for you i'm imagining as a cradle catholic you had the sacraments so for you to return to the church would involve going to confession and receiving the eucharist now gosh golly for you confession would have then probably been a pretty intense experience yes uh, f from based on your what you just talked about here yeah. going back to that sacrament what was that like? So th this, I think, too, is for so maybe if that person who's listening to this show who is that that revert or thinking of becoming that revert who was raised Catholic and has left the church for a long time, wandered around. I met lots of these people as an evangelical, right? Most of the people, not just, I shouldn't say most, but many people in the non denominational church that my wife and I were at uh, for the last bit of our before we both became Catholic were. were were former Catholics, they'd call themselves. Now we know they're still Catholic because they're they are baptized. <laughs> they can't help they can't help that unless they read a letter to the Pope and asked to be unbaptized, right? But but uh, we met these people. Uh, you know, we actually we, we ran a marriage uh, seminar, a marriage like uh, ministry at the church with a couple who were fabulous, who were who were former Catholics and met in the Catholic Church and then left that church together and and now we're in this non denominational church. For people like that, the, the return to the church is a matter of going to confession and receiving the Eucharist, right? Because they're still baptized Catholic and had the sacraments. Uh, and that experience of confession is, is a crazy thing to explain to to non-Catholic Christians who are looking into the Catholic faith and thinking, what is this weird confession thing? But I imagine also strange for somebody raised Catholic who maybe they did confession like in grade two yeah. or something, right? First, first reconciliation. Maybe a couple of times they went to Catholic high school along the way. But that may be a really weird, weird practice. And then here you are with, with tons of baggage, Eddie, to then bring back to the Catholic faith, which you go, I mentioned, yeah, this thing is true. I believe this now. I've researched this. This is the true thing. Now I have this giant hurdle to get over to, to come back in here, right? Is that kind of what it, that's what it would feel like to me, I think, imagine putting me in your shoes. No, nor normally I would agree. There was something that was so monumental in what happened with, confessing to a spouse right that in some ways when you don't understand the sacrament of reconciliation that what i had just gone through with my wife was so yeah. horrible yeah. so horrible that by comparison when i met with a priest and i had a general confession really you know mortal sin of whatever 15 plus years it was it's as if, how do I explain it? It's such a good question. It's like my baggage had been dropped on my wife in this process. And now I was grabbing it and doing the appropriate thing and handing it to God. And that session was amazing. In other words, I had yeah, yeah. courage that I would not have had had I not said things to my wife. So I took that courage into the confessional and my priest, I mean, he was, I say my priest because she was not Catholic at the time. He just said, I don't know the exact words, but it was in the vein of that was beautiful because you're, you're back. And it just, yeah. It's, it's, it was amazing. That's, that's what I can tell you. Yeah. Yeah. That's right away. That's the image of the particle sun for me, Eddie, right? The image of, and uh, of the particle sun coming, coming back and, and right. And the priest is, is, is Christ in that scene saying, this is beautiful. Welcome home. Like, I'm glad you're back. That's, that's a powerful thing. Wow. That, that's amazing. Okay. I want to, I want to, 
think about some other things here. I want to think about that that mental stop that you had, being raised Catholic, and then looking then you and your wife looking for a, a Christian faith to belong to. She'd left her her childhood faith, the Adventist faith, looking for a place to belong, but that that block of it well, can't be Catholic, right? So you're looking into all these other versions yep. and looking into. I mean, what? Where do you think that block comes from? I know for for me, in my experience, I became Christian at the age of fifteen or so, fourteen, fifteen, in high school. I got plugged into a, a Baptist church and then a Pentecostal church because my friends kind of went there and it was a close by. Had a good youth group. I, I di- didn't know a lot about the difference between you know Christian and Catholic, Protestant and Catholic. Those those things. I, I didn't know the Catholic Church and what it stood for because those people in my orbit were, were non-Catholic Christians. So I didn't really know a lot about it. You were raised Catholic, but there still was some kind of stop gap, there stop thing there that friends you from kind of looking looking back at that. I get it. For me, like the Reformation for us was kind of the beginning of the church, right? We had Acts of the Apostles and then Reformation, and that was it. in between was this nothing nothingness, yeah. right? Explain that more for, for me. Like, how did that work for you, that kind of, that barrier to going back further than the Reformation? Well, I think part of it is once you've shifted your worldview and you're now Protestant. So I don't know if I was going around saying I'm Protestant. <laughs> I probably just said I was raised Catholic and I'm attending a non-denominational church, right? So I kind of had that script. I didn't even I still didn't know what that meant, really. I didn't go around saying I'm born again, even though I had lifted my hands and had gone forward. So what I think happened and what happens with Catholics, well-meaning Catholics, um, someone opens a Bible and says, look here. It says, call no man father. It says there's only one mediator. It says, it says, it says. So they're diminishing the Catholic faith and you've shifted your view. I'm not saying anyone did that for me, but I think once you're in the Protestant worldview, that tradition and the interpretive lens takes on a different form to where in order to affirm Catholicism, well, first of all, it takes the Holy Spirit. And that's what I was describing to you. I don't know. I haven't heard too many instances. I mean, it's all the Holy Spirit, but I haven't heard too many instances where someone just says, you know what? I think I'm just going to start exploring uh, uh, what uh, Irenaeus said, or I'm just going to explore what Justin Martyr said. I wonder if uh, there was transubstantiation or the allusion to (laughs) transubstantiation in the second century. That just doesn't come up. So I think that that barrier is very, it's real for so many Protestants, but also those that didn't know their Catholic faith, they become Protestant, they, they are surrounded by people that affirm sola scriptura, so they're not going to look outside of scripture um, in any way, shape, or form, and as long as people continue to put their Bibles over their shoulders and say, don't forget what this says right here, even if it's piecemeal, you're not, you're not recognizing that, you're not saying, whoa, is there more to the story here? You're just so ignorance you have no a lot of people myself included you have no basis for so many doctrines if someone just grabs a verse and in isolation uh you keep repeating it it looks pretty darn convincing so i think that happens with a lot of catholics i've seen it all over youtube uh former catholics that become anti-catholic they start to grab the bible and say i don't see this in there i don't see this in there um so it's 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 sad for me to to kind of reflect on that um, to to be that ignorant of historic Christianity, um, but that's where I was. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, and I think you're, the the experience you described too with the the pastor and then the guest speaker is really also very fascinating, right? And I I can think of of several of these experiences in my own my own uh, faith journey. I, for a while, attended a very Pentecostal, very charismatic church in university for a few years, where quite literally the the pastor, who was a bodybuilder, whose credentials I'm not really sure what what they were, but he was a bodybuilder, big guy, 
actually arm wrestled, uh, you know, one of the other <laughs> members of staff for a sermon illustration one time. And I thought, this is it. This has jumped the shark. This has gone, gone too far. But he would sometimes contradict the associate pastor of the church in the same sermon series, right? And I thought, first of all, no one's editing these sermons to, to make sure there's continuity here. But it made me wonder how we know what we know, how we know we can be sure of what's being preached from, from the pulpit if these two guys in the same church are saying contradictory things yeah. in their sermons, right? And I, I talked to you too when I was on, on your show recently about my experience in a very charismatic kind of youth group, young adult type situation where I had a very, I think, well-meaning uh, man who I think was described as a prophet of some kind or had a prophetic kind of gift as a, as a, as a charismatic Christian who you know, when he asked me, have you seen visions? Have you, you know, have you spoken in tongues? Have you seen, you know, has God spoken into your life? And I kind of said, I don't, I don't think so. That was the wrong answer, right? And this guy really made me feel confused about my faith, that I had done something wrong. I didn't have enough faith. or wasn't doing no. the right things to be a Christian. I learned later his perspective on what it meant to be a Christian as this charismatic guy was very different from my pastor at my Pentecostal church, you know, 20 minutes down, down yeah. the street, right? But they're both part of the same denomination and, and under the same umbrella of, of doctrines that they would subscribe to as, as Pentecostal Christians, uh, where we were, but, but different contradictory things. So I have my own experience of that and how jarring that was and how for me, those kind of things were little kind of red flags and those, those added up to a point where I'm seeing so many red flags that when one more red flag comes along, yeah. it begins to tip the balance in favor of, well, I have to ask some more questions, right? Is that kind of your experience too, in, in terms of things were kind of adding up like that? A little bit. And I can say that before that, that barrier came crashing down, that I recognized that every church had, had its own statement of faith and there was this sentiment that as if they all, oh, well, we're all pretty much the same. Well, then everyone should have the same statement of faith. Yeah. Like that, that's what really resonated yeah. with me. Uh, and I interviewed someone, this is years later, I'm already a Catholic, this is on my channel. And he was telling me that here he is a recent college grad and he's at his local church and they come to him and say, we need you to write our statement of faith. <laughs> oh no. And he said that was a turning point for him so when I talk about on, on my channel, when I did a, a extended testimony, my reversion testimony, I mentioned that, that I recognized that everyone essentially was forming their own statement of faith. And, and when you start to see contradictions left and right, you can recognize, well, who's adhering to this statement of faith? That's the other thing. There's an assumption that because you're under a roof that you're adhering to that statement of faith. Well, you see the same problem anywhere, right? Yeah. But my fundamental point was when I started to fathom the Catholic Church, when I look up, if I'm looking up for a singular statement of faith, I find it yeah. in the creed. Yeah. I find it in the catechism. I see it completely backed up by scripture and all of these things and the magisterium, just forming one very clear. I mean, it, for me, it was it was it was everything because when I look back on the splintering that was happening and, and even ha hearing pastors talk about church splits, like it was this common thing, church splits. If you've gone through a church split, I met a woman at that church at our mega church. And she said, yeah, I'm going to try this out. I've been, she starts naming, I've been to this, that, that, that she named probably five Protestant denominations. And she said, I didn't like that pastor. I didn't really like the theology of this guy or he was affirming things I didn't agree with. I don't know what language she used. That was another interesting conversation that I had. Probably it was probably a few weeks leading up to the healing guest speaker. Uh, so yeah, it really came down to what are we all uniformly believing and that's what that's why the importance of the creed came up and really hit me between the eyes as well. Yeah, that's so fundamental. I, in my own experience, the church that my wife and I were attending, uh, when we first began to, it, it really emerged from a student church, became a kind of a family church, and so 
it was very organic in its origins, and we for a very long time had no kind of statement of faith. We were Pentecostal nominally under that umbrella, but had no, as a church, uh, a statement of faith. And we thought that was kind of cool. It was kind of trendy. It was the emergent church kind of era. Sure. And our, our statement of faith is very much journey based, you know, journey with us. We believe, you know, we believe Jesus, we're journeying with Jesus. We, it, when you, when you push came to shove, there were some core beliefs that the pastor and leadership team held, but we, when that, that team began to actually have to put things like put, put things down on paper, put meat on some bones, when issues began to crop up, it was then that everyone kind of realized, well, you know what? We all kind of believe different things in this church. Like we're all under the same roof. We're all in the same building, but because we had no statement of faith, we all kind of came in where we were and stayed where we were and didn't really, weren't really united in what we actually believed as Christians or what it was meant to be a Christian or, or the values that we held. And my wife and I kind of left at the, the kind of the beginning of that meltdown uh, and, and a lot of our, and some of our friends stayed, some actually left the faith entirely uh, as a result of those kind of experiences and questions that were brought up. But, but you realize then, yeah, that you need some kind of, even within that, <laughs> that church in this case, a unifying thing. And where else, where, anywhere else can you find that, right? That kind of unity that, for me, you know, Christ speaks to in John 17, when he, when the last prayer that's recorded of, of Christ on earth is praying for the unity, the very tangible, visible unity of Christians on earth. And I thought, well, if Jesus is praying for that, that must exist somewhere. That must, it must be possible for that to exist. It can't be a, a fairy tale or an impossible goal to reach because Christ is praying for it. Yeah. He isn't going to set an impossible goal for us or, or, or lie to us as, as, as his followers. Yes, I found I found that in 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 the creed, right in the Catholic Church, and nowhere else did anything like that kind of unity exist, right? And what struck me is, so when I was trying to cling to Protestantism, I said, "Well, you're not going to find two Catholics that agree; they're not united." And then I realized, well, you're not going to find clones of each other. <laughs> what matters is, do they have an umbrella, a united yeah. umbrella? And if they want to adhere to that or not, that's yeah, yeah. up to them, right? That's a personal decision. But if I go to this church on street A or street B or street C, and I see three different statements of faith, it starts to really speak to the chaos that started right after Luther. I mean, you can, you can see it years, years that followed Luther, that that was already going to be an issue. If you remove... The magisterium you don't really remove the magisterium you become the magisterium and those that follow also become forms of magisterium and so the very thing that you protest against you cannot help but become so you may disagree with the understanding of dogmas and doctrines but the fundamental things that are being protested as it relates to authority as it relates to i'll just stick with that as it relates to authority, you cannot help but say, hey, you're not the authority. Okay, then who is? The Holy Spirit is. All right. Uh, which church is in, which, which churches are united? Are all denominations united? No, but we agree on the major things. Okay, what major things? <laughs> Where did you get that? Um, so you start to, this is what I like now about what I'm seeing in on YouTube and, and elsewhere. Catholics have had even in recent, in recent years, this idea where you have to defend, defend, defend. We've got to be able to ask questions. So if there are logical questions that are being asked of Catholics, we've got to be able to ask Protestants, likewise, who founded your, church, your the theology? Where You've got to be able to trace this to someone, and why would you put your faith in that person's exegesis versus a church that, if you study it, you can start to see the continuity all the way to the early church. All you have to do is do some research. So yeah, uh, that, that's fantastic. I want to ask you in a minute about this because you have a great YouTube video on this on, on a very similar uh, subject to this, and I think it was fascinating to talk about and discuss in a, in a bit here. Before that, I want to say that yes, like <laughs> absolutely yes, Andy. This is the thing, and I think what's amazing about being Catholic is you don't have to. If, if you push me on a topic that, that 
of, of faith on, on, on baptism or on salvation or on the Lord's Supper or communion. I don't have to go, well, here's what my church believes. Here's what I believe. Here's what these theologians that I've, 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 I've read believe. I can go, well, I'm Catholic. This is what the church believes. And I can, and I can not agree with that. I can uh, uh, be in opposition with that and not be a very good Catholic. But then you can say, hey, you're not a good, very good Catholic because <laughs> this is what the church believes. You're, you're dissenting from this, not agreeing with this. Maybe you don't understand it very well. Maybe you have reasons why you don't agree with this. But yeah. we, we can measure... You know, we can measure who's in and who's out, who's who's orthodox and who's not, who's following the church and who's not. And that's important to know wh- wh- where I stand for me as a Catholic if I'm if I'm following the church's teaching properly, which really can't be done, as you say, in Protestant Christianity, because you can you can find a home for your beliefs in. in in a church down the street, right? If I if I believe that the communion is not fully symbolic, there's some kind of tangible, real element in there, like a Lutheran position or something, I can find a church that affirms that. And if my church that I'm at doesn't affirm that, and I've come to realize that this is, I think, the truth, I can f- leave that church and go somewhere else. And I'm still calling myself a Christian, That's just right. not at that particular church, right? But if I if I suddenly say, you know what, the Eucharist is just merely symbolic, Lord's Supper is just merely symbolic, but still call myself a Catholic. Well, you can say, hey, well, look, here's what the catechism says. You might think this, Keith, but here's what the church believes. You're actually in in error here, yeah. right? There's an actual way of holding me to account. And I think that's so important. Otherwise, we have a kind of spiritual or, or, or Christian relativism, right? Where you can just believe what you want, but still be a Christian and still find a home for that. And gosh, that's got to be like one of the biggest tricks of the devil, I think, on Christians, right? I don't want to be—I don't want to be too charismatic and 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 dramatic here, but that's got to be a huge way that we have the the wool pulled over our eyes if we can think that we can kind of believe our interpretation is okay and we're still mainly Catholic because we agree on the essentials. Well, no, we we don't if we can differ on essentials like that and still go to a church that that disagrees with a different church over here and still both cases be called Christian. Like that's, that's a big problem in it's my mind. Problem. There's another thing um, that I wanted to mention. I don't know if this is your experience, but if a, if a priest is caught in scandal and trust me, this is not too much of a tangent. Um, if a priest is caught in scandal, the headlines read Catholic priest caught in scandal might get pretty detailed in that in that headline or in, the, in that article. That's a reflection of the entire Catholic Church. And that, in my opinion, speaks to the unity of the church, the hierarchy of the church, oh, and the risk that is involved in being part of one body. When you go and you hear about scandal at a local non-denominational church, That is not a stain, in my observation, on Protestantism. It's a stain on that church. And it might be a stain on, hey, these guys that are, what's their background? Did we vet these guys? That kind of thing. But it doesn't say Protestant pastor, you know, has a scandal here. And it's not a stain because they're so, it's so diluted. The entire, I don't care uh, what branch it is, it all flows from Luther. That That is undeniable. So whatever that remnant is, it's not a reflection on all of Protestantism. But with the Catholics, you're going to hear about it. If it's a single priest, a single bishop, it reflects. And there, you know, there will be comments about Whore of Babylon that follow because one priest made a mistake. So I, again, maybe that was too much of a tangent, but I just found that fascinating in my exploration as well. I'm like, why does it not affect the entire thing? But for Catholics, it affects the entire thing. It's a stain on the entire body. And that 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 resonated with me for what it's worth. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. That's a really fascinating point. And that's a, a sad way of illustrating a very good point, Eddie. I know. Because it involves scandal like that. But you're right. That does speak to the unity 
of the whole entire church, right? And so say, for example, I lived through, my wife and I lived through a very terrible priestly scandal in a parish we were going to. Uh, we, we got through it. It was difficult and challenging. It still remains uh, an issue of, of trauma and, and, and healing. Yeah. At the same, at a similar time, my, my Protestant family, my uh, close family, my parents and sister and brother-in-law, and also went through a very terrible, similar scandal at their evangelical, non-denominational kind of church. Right. And in, in both those cases, in, in my case, you know, this priest was literally you know, disciplined by the Pope, quite literally. Right. In, in their in their version, this this uh, pastor was kind of uh, not quietly, but kind of shuffled off by the small denomination that they kind of belonged to. It impacted the people that went to that church. And that was kind of it. But that was that was the end of it. Right. That that's very different when one of those scandals right involves the whole hierarchy right involves this, a huge network of, of of people that are united and it's a guy on the very very top that had to say you know what that was that was wrong and discipline that person yeah those are very different things right one's a small kind of denomination and and one really yeah that that speaks to the unity in, in a sad way of this huge global catholic church right i think that's yeah that's a really interesting interesting i and know that's weird disappoint, disappointing point you, weird, but, you've but, made me happy and made me sad at the same time it's but it's real it's 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 real and i'd rather yeah talk about it so for example even on the southern baptist convention they had an issue yeah i wouldn't want to look at everyone that is a southern baptist as a result and say well you're condemned because this there was a network of whatever going on here Again, it, it was a stain on that denomination. It only rose to a certain level, but it didn't rise to a point where yeah. Sola Scriptura is therefore invalid, much like the papacy is now invalid by virtue of a local priest committing a scandal. Yeah. I'm just yeah. saying, like, it, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't make logical sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a good point. Okay, talk to us a little bit about uh, the, the, uh, one of the videos on your channel. There's fantastic content on your channel. It's awesome, Eddie. Uh, and I hope that people that are watching, listening to this, go and find those things. Those links are in the show notes. We'll link to those things. So they can find it. You have a fantastic uh, a a video essay, I think you call it, on, on Luther and some of the results of, of the Reformation. And that for me was very impactful because I've been doing some reading as I've become Catholic and since then deeply into the life of someone like Luther and the Reformation and, and Calvin and some of the ideas of the Reformers and some of the consequences of the Reformation. Also, I've had a couple of guests on this show who've, who've spoken deeply in those areas that I think, gosh, I, I, I don't know that apart from all my other research, if I could remain Protestant thinking through some of these things sure. in this way, because it's a little bit scandalous in some ways and really makes you rethink what, what's going on in at the birth of your, your, your Protestant faith. So I don't know where you want to, how you want to summarize this, how you want to unpack this, but take us a little bit on this journey because it's really a fascinating journey and I think speaks to some of the things that you discovered as you were yeah. then looking back into your re-looking at your your Catholic faith and the Reformation from this perspective that you have as a, as a revert. No, great. I appreciate that. And I think you had, didn't you have Don Johnson recently? Uh, yeah, we did. Yeah, good he, guy. I need to get his book because it, it seems like it's in the same vein as yeah. what, what I did with my Reformation essay. But the, the core of the essay is comparing Thomas More, St. Thomas More to Martin Luther, because they lived at the same time period. They even wrote he wrote indirectly to Thomas More. He wrote to King Henry VIII, Martin Luther, that is. And Thomas More refuted his points um, in his own tract to Luther. And I'm trying to show that the majority of the Reformation came down to, in a sense, these two men. And Thomas More being led by and explaining himself with reason and Luther largely using emotion. And I was trying to show that the emotion, um, even if he was calling out some legitimate concerns, legitimate abuses in the 95 Theses and in other writings that he had, what happened in his comments and what you could see soon thereafter. So within 10 years of the Reformation 
officially kicking off. Of course, at that time, it wasn't called the Reformation. Everything's in hindsight, and same with the solas. This is all stuff that happens later. But Luther, in his, uh, what was it, 1525, 1526, I don't know, he starts noticing that people are departing from his understanding of Scripture, from his interpretation of Scripture, and starts to call out people like, Zwingli. And at the same time, he has a contemporary, this guy Andreas Karlstadt, that is calling Luther and his followers new papists because who the heck are these guys making rules? We don't like authority. We don't like, don't you understand? We don't like official doctrinal truths. We don't, I shouldn't say that, that's a caricature, but in other words, we don't want that type of authority. Why are we finding it again in you? And then Luther's pointing at Zwingli saying, you're not getting to the scriptures right. And then Calvin's going to pivot a little bit. And then the gentleman that started Anabaptism, uh, Conrad Grable, he's going to pivot a little bit. There's going to be wars over this. Uh, you're going to see King Henry VIII that pivots in a very unique way, right? You're going to see John Knox pivot, uh, Wesley pivot, come to the 18th, 19th centuries. You're going to have other pioneers. These are all pioneers in their own minds. I'm starting down a new path. I'm picking up some of the old, but it's new and my lens is correct. And I'm going to get the correct theological permutation here that will launch a new church. Even if they wouldn't say it in those terms, that's what started to happen. And then you'd have people that would say they were inspired. Again, this is apart from any continuity. That's, that's the key. Uh, we're not talking about mystics. We're talking about those that just pick up a Bible and say, I'm inspired by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to start a, a church and people will certainly follow me. And so you start to see a lot of um, cult-like activity where Sola Scriptura, uh, people will continue to affirm it, but then they'll have supplemental writings. And then you start to see uh, just this radical, how do I say it, like relativism that's coming forth from these new programs to where Catholic teaching, you can see traces of it. But over time, it's like it gets more and more foreign. So that's the other thing. Um, back to my story. I understand a Protestant looks to like, say, 1400 or 1300. It's so foreign to them because it's almost as if all of those traces eventually just evaporate. And so when you see vestments and you see candles and you see incense, you think it's some pagan ridiculous charade when in fact we've just lost the connection um so the essay back to the essay the the point there was to just show here's what thomas moore was saying i'm going to stand with the historic church luther saying i'm going to go this route but then immediately thereafter you can say okay who are you going to follow who who is it that you're going to follow you can't say the Holy Spirit, and then say that my, I get my theology, it tra you can trace my theology to 1523. You have to be honest about that because the Catholic Church, if we're saying we can trace, we can trace the development of something, and you just keep connecting these dots, and you see the development of everything. And I think it's um, unfortunate that when a dogma gets declared in the Catholic Church, a lot of people will say, it just started. That idea just started at Vatican I or Vatican II. No, it didn't. It got translated. It was declared in that moment. But there has to be some semblance of connection. So, And this, this ties to everything. This ties to the Assumption, the Immaculate Conception. This ties to all the things that are these hot topics that that's kind of lazy to say, oh, when it was dogmatically declared, that's when the church invented it. And so the essay talks about this continuity um, and the structure of the church and how Thomas More decided to stay home and he was obeying his conscience. His conscience was formed by 1500 years of tradition 
Luther was saying, I cannot go against my conscience, God help me. But there was this emotionally charged reaction and the results uh, affirm that. Yeah, and the immediate results, like you point out, right? The immediate results, like within Luther's lifetime, people are are protesting against Luther himself and what he was doing, right? Saying that he was wrong on these things. Once you begin to unchain that, right, the, the, your 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 theology from from history, from a rootedness, you you can object to to the problems you see in the church. Absolutely, I mean, you should do that still today, right? But there's a difference between reforming a church and rejecting that church and kind of doing your your own thing, right? That that quite clearly in Luther's lifetime spawned all kinds of problems, right? Yeah, as, exactly. As you point out. Yeah, and um, even reform. What is reform if you have to separate yourself from the very thing, the very essence, the very structure, the very body that brought you to that point? the doctrines and all the councils and all the things that he, like Luther, for example, he, to a certain point, would affirm. And then he started tossing out portions yeah, yeah. of councils. And I would argue you're almost forced to start breaking other things down because you do, in your brain, understand, I'm kind of cutting off the branch that I'm sitting on, to quote C.S. Lewis as it relates to atheism. It's very similar you start to cut off the branch you're sitting on well maybe you're going to try to reshape that tree in the process like what this can't be happening or pretend that you're jumping to another limb um, but that's what i started to see with his comments because he just said a, a pope might err a council might err but holy scripture is I, I, I it's not verbatim but he's saying only holy scripture we can we can depend upon and then he's telling zwingli the way you're handling scripture is ridiculous so yeah, yeah, that's that's a fascinating set of events, right? I think what you said too about doctrine and dogma is interesting because, you know, that's a an, a common charge from non-Catholic Christians to Catholics. Like, oh, you invented this thing just out of out of whole cloth, like the Catholic conception just invented that. You know, the these these doctrines surrounding Mary that the Church affirms throughout history are they're unhinged from Scripture. They're just kind of made up and affirmed just out of out of the blue. I think I, I thought that for a bit on my journey, and someone gave me a copy of Father John Harden's Catholic Catechism, which is a catechism, you know, it's, it's about yay thick, and it was a bright yellow cover, I think comes from the 50s or something, kind of before before the, the big catechism was put together by the church following Vatican II. Yeah. This was kind of how one of the ways that Catholics could understand their faith. And he goes into great detail in this book about how those doctrines and dogmas were actually formed. And you realize... And I realized quite quickly, and that, and then put aside that prejudice, that those those were developed. Those weren't just decided upon by a pope out of nowhere. Yes. But the the church was thinking of these things and developing these things, understanding these things, unpacking these things. Uh, you know, through the the authority the church believes was handed down to the apostles through the magisterium and, and, and from Christ Himself to actually, you know, bind and loose these things. Right. So, if you if you can, as a non-Catholic Christian, put aside the prejudices that the Catholic Church is inventing things or adding to Scripture and actually look into the origins of these things, I think that undoing those misunderstandings goes a long way to actually giving the Catholic Church a fair, uh, you, know, you know, a fair shake, actually uh, to understand what the Church actually believes, right, and where these beliefs kind of come from. I think that's really, you know, an, an important thing, practice, if you actually want to be sincere, to, to begin to do. I think, right? Yeah. And you, I think many Protestants would talk about, hey, the development of the of the dogma of the Trinity, for example. Yeah. They yeah. can fathom why that wasn't declared the minute Jesus ascended. <laughs> they, they can fathom that that's not, that is a mystery and it's a beautiful thing that we have it. And it was dogmatically declared, but it took time. Yeah. And the church cannot snap her fingers and have all the dogmas announced. That'd be great. That's not how it works. And yeah. so I also think it's an, it's another witness, the living, breathing witness that will declare things at a time when they are needed, whether we understand that or not. I wholeheartedly believe that about the councils and when they were placed. And even if we dispute the consequences of certain councils, 
we're just seeing we're just seeing surface level and so i think that god's plans are, are certainly bigger than anything that we can comprehend and so i i think it's a it's a beautiful beautiful faith to see the continuity and that's what i really <laughs> wanted to uh, hit home yeah with the, uh, yeah. With the essay. yeah yeah Oh, that's, that's fantastic. You did a great job with it too, Eddie. It's, it's awesome. It's well well worth uh, the, the watch. And we'll link to those things uh, in the show notes. Uh, Eddie, it's been a, a blast. I can think of a million more things to talk to you about. So this won't be your last time on, on this show. Definitely, despite the insult in the opening seconds of the show. Uh, thanks. I'm still smarting from that. But uh, d- def- definitely uh, have you back, Eddie, for more conversations because there's a lot, lot for us to unpack in these kinds of uh, discussions. Where can can, uh, where do you want to point listeners and viewers towards uh, to find more from what you're doing, hear your story, read your stuff? Where, where should they go? Where's the best place to point them towards? You should go to the, the YouTube channel, Catholic Recon, at Catholic Recon, and you'll find me. And uh, yeah, and then also eddietrask.com for more, more resources. Well, that, that's easy. That's awesome. And we'll put, put links to those places in the description of the video and the link uh, in the notes for this uh, podcast as well. Eddie, thanks for being here today. Thanks for uh, talking to me twice in the span of a week. I appreciate your patience and your long suffering-ness uh, for putting up with that, Eddie. And uh, God bless you and the work you're doing for the church. And thank you so much for being here uh, tonight for our discussion. Thanks thank a lot. You. God bless you. Thanks for all your work too. Thanks, Eddie. Take care. Take care.